I'm not used to this uh, wonderful punctuality because in Italy, if something is scheduled for 10, you might think of possibly starting to begin around 10.15. Uh, I'm grateful to your pastor, Father Malata, for uh, inviting me this weekend. I came a couple of years ago, two years or three years ago. I can't remember, it all blurs together, you know, at a certain age. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here again. This uh, presentation today is in the context of the year of faith, as uh, Father was saying, called by Pope Benedict XVI to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. That was October 11th, 1962. And the purpose of this year of faith, very simply, is to strengthen our faith. Uh, what is this faith that we're talking about? That is, we should define our terms. Uh, in theology, there's a classical distinction between fides que and fides qua. Fides que means the faith which we believe, that is the content of the faith. And fides qua is the faith by which we believe, which refers to our personal conviction, the uh, appropriation of the content of the faith. In this presentation, uh, we're talking primarily about the objective content. That is, what is it that we believe? And throughout all of church history, uh, we've needed a standard or norm of belief, especially in times of crisis. Let me use an analogy. Uh, in order to uh, grasp this content, uh, which is communicated to us by the scripture and by tradition, we need to wear special glasses, interpretive glasses. Identifying these glasses was a pressing concern in the early church. In the first four centuries especially, as the content of faith was being defined in the face of theological controversy, there was a real need for a normative standard. What do we believe? What is the core of that belief? Does that core give us certain norms? Norms for interpreting the scripture, for example, or norms for Christian living? The fathers of the church articulated that core content by using two expressions that are very useful. I'm simplifying for the sake of clarity. The two expressions are the rule of faith, regula fidei, which originates uh, in the baptismal creed as a core of the faith, and mystery of faith, miserium fidei, which means the liturgy as an expression of that core of the faith. Uh, these two uh, rules, the rule of faith, the mystery of faith, uh, constitute the glasses I was talking about. You could even describe them as bifocals because there are two of them. So let's take a look at these two approaches, um, and the conference will be in two parts. Uh, so if you uh, notice on your green sheet, that might be helpful to follow along, the two parts are the history of these two terms, and then secondly, the implications of that history uh, for our contemporary situation. So let's begin with the history of the, these two terms. First of all, the rule of faith, the regula fidei. A patristic scholar named Vittorino Grossi lists four ways that the fathers tended to use this expression, regula fidei, or its equivalent. And those four are, are listed here. Uh, the rule of faith established a norm, a standard, for interpreting the scriptures, for determining the doctrinal meaning of certain words, especially in the context of heresy. The rule of faith established a norm for customs of Christian life and practice, and we'll look at some of them. And the rule of faith, finally, is equated with the brief summary that we find in the creed, that is, I believe, in the Father, the Son and in the Holy Spirit, uh, this creed originally used in the context of baptism. Let's begin then with the first of these uh, uses of the term, that is the regula fide as a norm for interpreting the scriptures. And I'll give you two examples. The first example is from Matthew 28, and you know these passages. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's the scripture text. Now we need to put on these special glasses in order to interpret. What does this mean? Especially in the context of the Arian controversy, which went on for centuries. The Arians, without wearing these special glasses, said, see, the Father and the Son are listed separately in this passage. So they're obviously not the same. One is first, the Father, who is God, and one is second, the Son, who is not God. Because according to the Arians, the Son is not equal to the Father, not eternal with the Father, but created by the Father from nothing as an instrument for the creation of the world. Therefore, the Son is not God by nature, but a changeable creature. So what the Arians mean by, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, is not the same thing that Catholics believe when they say the same thing. Here are some patristic uh, examples to flesh this out a little bit. Eusebius of Vercelli, who died in 371, we're talking about the fourth century, he wrote a treatise on the Trinity, and uh, the book seven of this treatise is called The Profession of the Catholic Rule of Faith with the Rebuke of Heretics. And his argument is this. If you take the last part of the scriptural text I just uh, cited for you, that is, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Eusebius will say that the phrase, in the name, refers to the oneness of God, whereas the rest of the text, of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, refers to the persons of the Trinity. So you have both the oneness of God and the threeness of the, of the divine persons in that scriptural text, if you're wearing the proper glasses. Here are the texts of Eusebius. He says, truly, in this statement, the scripture the passage I just quoted, the united name of the Godhead, in the name, goes before the rest of the phrase of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Truly, in this most sacred trinity, the second part, the individual names are expressed, but only concerning the persons, not the Godhead. Based upon that affirmation, he then addresses himself, somewhat sarcastically, to the Arians, saying this, I beg you earnestly to declare those things to me concerning the rule of the scriptures. Know first of all that in this expression of the scripture, the content of the faith is expressed. Then he asks a series of rhetorical questions to addressing himself to the Arians, saying, why then do you correctly celebrate the rule of baptism that is, they used water and they used this expression in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Why do you correctly celebrate the rule of baptism, yet blaspheme in the profession of the Trinity? Since the persons, they say, are distinguished in the united name, the oneness of the Godhead. Now that's a little bit uh, technical and complicated, but uh, we can summarize it easily. Here we have a scripture passage that's fundamental uh, to uh, uh, communicating who God is. How are we supposed to interpret that scripture passage correctly? The Arians mean one thing when they say it, and the Catholics mean another. How do we know which is the correct interpretation? By means of the rule of faith. But exactly what that rule is, is not clearly explained in this passage. A second example. We're still on the norm for interpreting scriptures of your outline. This second example comes from St. Ambrose, who dies in 397, still in the fourth century. He uh, preached a series of sermons on creation based on a work by the, uh, of, on the same subject by St. Basil. And the context is a debate about the nature of matter is matter created by God, or is it uncreated, pre-existent, and co-eternal with God? And in that case, God didn't create matter, 
he just fashioned what was already there. It's a very contemporary sort of question. The text uh, that we need to interpret is from Genesis, about the first day in the creation of the world, but uh, the text really doesn't answer this question. And so the scripture, uh, in this particular instance, is ambiguous. Here's the passage. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, that could mean uh, God created ex nihilo, out of nothing. But then the next sentence says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. Well, was the earth without form already there, or did that happen after God spoke and it was created? Uh, it's a poetic description, and it doesn't give the kind of uh, philosophical clarity that we're looking for. So one could conclude that God fashioned the earth, this is a heretical conclusion, God fashioned the earth out of some kind of primal matter, but that's not orthodox teaching. How are we to know the correct interpretation? So St. Ambrose in his uh, sermon says this, I ask you therefore not to follow the traditions of philosophy, nor those who gather the appearance of truth in the vain deceit of the arts of persuasion, but rather follow the rule of truth, which is set forth in the inspired words of God. So what should our standard of interpretation be? Not the nature of the elements, Ambrose says, but Christ himself, who created the world in the abundance and fullness of his divinity, he should be our standard in the examination of what was created and in the question as to what natural power is able to achieve. What does this mean, that Christ should be the standard? Well, in John's Gospel, in the prologue, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through him, and here's the key passage, without him was not anything made that was made. So we have a, a rather contemporary question here, a pitting faith against science, you might even say, that is, how should we understand the creation of the world? And Ambrose says, accordance with the regula fidei set forth in the scriptures. That is, you need to wear these special glasses. Let's pass on to number two. Uh, the rule of faith is a norm for determining the doctrinal meaning of certain words. I have to have my bottle. The father that I refer to in this case is St. Augustine in the City of God. And the context is this, a philosophers often, that is, there's a, a, you can study a God from the point of view of philosophy, but when philosophers express their ideas about God, they often use language imprecisely. And Augustine is referring in particular to the philosopher named Porphyry, whom perhaps we've never heard of, but that's the context. And Augustine says, now, we know what this philosopher means as a Platonist when he talks about principles. He means God the Father and God the Son, the Son being called the intellect or mind of the Father by this philosopher. As to the Holy Spirit, he says nothing, or at least nothing that is clear. He does mention a third entity holding a middle place between these two principles, but I don't quite understand what he means, says Augustine. No doubt, he tries to explain what he means, no doubt this was the best way Porphyry was able or willing to indicate what we call the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit neither of the Father alone, nor of the Son, but of both. For philosophers use words loosely, and even in matters which are very difficult to understand, they are reckless about offending religious ears. We Christians, however, feel obliged to speak according to a definite norm. That's the key phrase here. And to avoid that license of words, which so engenders an irreligious attitude, 
for the realities which words were meant to signify. That's perhaps a little bit complicated too, but we can summarize by saying we need to use precise language when talking about God, and we have a definite norm for doing so. Once again, what exactly that norm is, Augustine doesn't elaborate in this particular text. Let's pass to number three. The rule of faith establishes norms of Christian life and practice. The example I want to use is the dating of Easter. This was a long controversy in the early church, uh, beginning in Asia Minor, but extending to other parts of, of the Christian world. And the controversy was especially, especially heated in England at the time of St. Bede the Venerable in the, fourth, in the seventh century. There were two traditions, two ways of calculating the date of Easter. One was Easter has to be on the 14th day of the, of the month of Nisan, the Jewish uh, calendar. And because uh, it was the 14th day, in Latin, quattro decimus, these people are called quattro decimens. That is, they celebrated Easter on the 14th day of the Jewish month of Nisan. Whatever day of the week it happened to fall upon, uh, just as today is the 28th day, is that right? Yes. Of September, well, this year it happened to be a Saturday. Last year it was on another day. Uh, and so it, it doesn't depend on the day of the week, it depends on the number. So the, the uh, Quattro Decimen celebrated Easter sometimes in the middle of the week, sometimes on the weekend, Sunday. Um, but the Sunday wasn't important. The other way of calculating Easter was to celebrate always on Sunday, but the Sunday following the first moon, the first full moon after the spring equinox. It's a little bit, uh, you need uh, astronomy to help you calculate these things. But that was the Roman practice, to celebrate on Sunday, not on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, on Sunday. Saint Eusebius of Caesarea, a different Eusebius, a common name in those days, we don't hear it too much today. Uh, in his ecclesiastical history, uh, we're still in the fourth century, defends the quattro decimens, quoting a certain bishop named Pol Polycrates, who lists all his predecessors and explains that all of them follow the quattro decimen custom. He says, all these observe the 14th day of the Passover according to the gospel, never devi deviating, but following according to the rule of the faith. And he cites the wonderful account of the visit of St. Polycarp to Rome. And Polycarp followed the Quattro Decimen custom. And Polycarp's differences with Pope Anicetus on this question. This is the uh, description in the ecclesiastical history. Neither was Anicetus able to persuade Polycarp not to observe this custom, inasmuch as Polycarp had always observed it, together with John, the disciple of the Lord, and the other apostles with whom he had lived. Neither, on the other hand, did Polycarp persuade Anicetus to observe it. For Anicetus said that he was obliged to cling to the practice of those who were presbyters before him. And under these conditions, neither convinced the other, they communicated with each other, and in the church, Pope Anicetus conceded the celebration of the Eucharist to Polycarp, obviously out of respect for him, and they departed from each other peacefully. What does that mean? That is, if liturgical practices differ, does that mean that one rule of faith can allow for differing liturgical practices? There's a modern application of that, which I'll speak about uh, toward the end. But here we see that the rule of faith is not sufficient to establish custom without some authority to define what belongs to the rule of faith and what doesn't. To continue our analogy, who adjusts the prescription of the glasses when your vision is cloudy or unclear? You need somebody to do that. That's number three. Now on to number four. 
The rule of faith is a summary of the content of what we believe as formulated in the creed. Two examples of this, one from St. Irenaeus, who writes in the second century, in his work called The Proof of the Apostolic Teaching, a kind of catechetical work uh, in order to refute error and expound the faith. The context is the punishment of heretics. Uh, so um, Irenaeus says, lest we be punished in the same way, we must keep strictly, without deviation, the rule of faith. What is that? This is what faith does for us, he says, as the elders, the disciples of the apostles, have handed down to us. First of all, the rule of faith admonishes us to remember that we have received baptism for the remission of sins in the name of God the Father and in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became incarnate and died and was raised, and in the Holy Spirit of God, and that this baptism is the seal of eternal life and is rebirth unto God, that we be no more children of mortal men, but of the eternal and everlasting God. So that's a summary of the rule of faith, which is basically the creed. And he goes on to say, there are three articles of faith, and this is the drawing up of our faith, the foundation of the building, the consolidation of a way of life. God the Father, uncreated, beyond grasp, invisible, one God, the maker of all. This is the first and foremost article of our faith. But the second article is the Word of God, the Son of God, Christ Jesus our Lord. And the third article is the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the baptism of our rebirth comes through these articles, granting us rebirth unto God the Father, through his Son, by the Holy Spirit. So the rule of faith for Irenaeus is the Trinitarian formula used in baptism and elaborated in the Creed. In Rome, this developed into what we call the Apostles' Creed. The Creed from Nicaea and Constantinople is a creed from those cities, councils held in those cities, which elaborated the core of the faith using more precise philosophical and theological language. And so in, at Mass on Sunday, we recite the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. Uh, and in the 2002 uh, edition of the Missal, the Apostles' Creed is also given as an option. But they're both, uh, the Apostles' Creed originates in a baptismal context, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed in the context of clarifying uh, Christological teaching. A second example about the rule of faith and baptism, which comes from Tertullian uh, in the second century. And once again, it's a polemical context against various heresies. Tertullian says, now, with regard to the rule of faith, it is, you must know, it is that which prescribes the belief, so it establishes belief, content, that there is only one God, and that he is none other than the creator of the world, who produced all things out of nothing through his own word, first of all sent forth. That this word is called his son, and under the name of God was seen in diverse manners by the patriarchs. For example, in the uh, voice speaking from the burning bush, the fathers say that's the word that is the second person of the Trinity before the incarnation. That's what's behind this. Heard at all times in the prophets, at last brought down by the spirit and power of the Father into the Virgin Mary, was made flesh in her womb, and being born of her, went forth as Jesus Christ. Thenceforth he preached the new law and the new promise of the kingdom of heaven, worked miracles. Then, having been crucified, he rose again on the third day. Having ascended into the heavens, he sat at the right hand of the Father, and then sent instead of himself the power of the Holy Ghost to lead such as believe. He will come with glory to take the saints to the enjoyment of everlasting life and the heavenly promises, 
and to condemn the wicked to everlasting fire after the resurrection of both these classes shall have happened, together with the restoration of their flesh. This rule, summarizing all that he just said, this rule, as it will be proved, was taught by Christ and raises among ourselves no other questions than those which heresies introduce and which make men heretics. In other words, if you contest this rule of faith, then you're asking heretical questions. He summarizes by saying, now our faith has been deposited in this rule. And to know nothing else in opposition to the rule of faith is to know all things. So to summarize uh, this uh, point number four, the rule of faith is equated with an early version of the Apostles' Creed. That is, the baptismal formula uh, elaborated uh, to uh, express the core of the faith. Let me summarize this first uh, part on the rule of faith. We've seen the, the difficulty of defining the content of our faith. But the expression rule of faith is equated with the baptismal creed precisely to define that content. But the rule of faith seems to be even more fundamental than the baptismal creed because it includes not only the profession of faith but also various customs, especially liturgical customs. And we'll look more about that in, in the second part of the Stadium Fide. What is the origin of the rule of faith? By what authority was it formulated? Is it fixed or does it develop? Cardinal Newman has a whole treatise on the development of doctrine. What is the relationship between authority and this rule of faith, this tradition? In the history of the church, the rule of faith tended to be used as a negative norm, that is, a limit or check for unorthodox teaching. Can the rule of faith also be used as a positive norm to guide theological research today? We'll return to some of these questions as we go along. So much for the regula fidei, now that we pass to the miserium fidei, that is from the creed to the liturgy. We've seen that the expression rule of faith refers especially to the baptismal creed, but also includes liturgical practices. And we saw in particular the date of Easter as a question for the rule of faith. The rule of faith serves as an interpretive lens for reading and interpreting scriptures and for reading and interpreting the tradition. There's another expression, a similar one, mysterium fidei, which broadens the field of our inquiry. Just as the rule of faith, the baptismal creed, establishes the norm for the content of the faith, so also the mysterium fidei and what that means I'll explain shortly, establishes a norm for right belief. I'd like to give two examples from the patristic tradition, as indicated on your uh, handout, that is from Leo the Great, who dies in 461, and Prosper of Aquitaine, who was Leo's secretary. Let's begin with Saint Leo. There's a well-documented thesis, not a proven fact, but a thesis, that the phrase mysterium fidei was inserted into the Roman canon by Saint Leo the Great. In the extraordinary form, mysterium fidei is part of the words of, of the consecration of the chalice. In the ordinary form, that phrase was taken out of its original context and placed after both consecrations as an acclamation. What did it mean in its original context? Just so that you have it in your, in your head. Uh, the, the words go, this is the chalice of my blood, the new and everlasting covenant, the mystery of faith, which was poured out for you and for many for the remission of sins. So the phrase mystery of faith originally didn't pertain to the consecration of the, of the, of the host, but to the chalice. Why? This is a fascinating story. 
It has to do with the Manichaean controversy, which broke out in Rome uh, around the year 444, while Leo was Pope. They came from North Africa. Remember, Augustine was a Manichaean. I'll say more about what that means in a moment. But with the Vandal invasion of North Africa, a large number of Manichaeans were driven out and took refuge in Italy. Leo's sermons and letters demonstrate his real concern lest the, the doctrinal integrity of his flock be compromised. So he acted immediately and forcefully against the Manichaean threat. What's of interest, interest to us here is that when the Manichaeans took part in the Catholic Eucharist, under both species, they refused to receive from the chalice. St. Leo says in a sermon, when, when to hide their infidelity, they dare to take part in our mysteries, Mys mysteries here means the Eucharist, nothing else. When they dare to take part in our mysteries, they adapt themselves, when they take uh, communion, in such a way that sometimes, in order to conceal themselves more safely, they receive the body of Christ with an unworthy mouth, but they absolutely refuse to drink the blood of our redemption. What do these strange Eucharistic practices of the Manichaeans mean? Well, in order to understand that, we need to um, uh, understand their taboos about food. In their dualistic view of the world, I'm going to go on at some length about this because it's curious and interesting. They had a dualistic world view of the world. There's good and evil, a good God and an evil God. Uh, in their dualistic view of the world, the divine substance had been mixed with the substance of evil in order to repress that evil and restrain its power. The object of the practice of religion was to release the divine particles of light imprisoned in matter. It sounds like New Age things today. There's nothing new under the sun. The freeing of the divine particles has an ascending motion from the earth up to heaven. From the earth itself, that is from the soil, this is really bizarre, divine particles enter into plants because their roots are fixed in the earth, and thence pass upwards as vapor into heaven. Plants, therefore, contain the divine particles and can be eaten, although in the very cutting, cooking, and eating of the plants, some particles escape. It's better to eat them raw. When animals eat plants, they fetter the divine particles, which are only gradually increased by motion, the carrying of burdens, exercise, toil, or any other sort of activity, including digestion. When an animal is killed, there is very little divine substance left, and the very slaying of the animal disperses whatever divine particles may have remained. So eating meat is forbidden. Now wine is a special case. Manichaeans could eat grapes, but the pressing of the grapes to make wine kills the grapes. For that reason, must, that is the unfermented juice as pressed from the grape, is forbidden. And all the more so, fermented must, or wine, is forbidden. Wine was considered something devilish, concealing not particles of light, but particles of darkness. The fruit of the vine was the bile of the prince of darkness himself, and hence absolutely loathsome. The Manichaeans, therefore, even while secretly participating in the Catholic Eucharist, had a totally different understanding of its meaning. In the Manichaean view, every meal of the elect was a holy meal, in which they took into themselves the flesh and blood of Jesus, that is, particles of light, which were dispersed in plants and fruits. This is the Manichaean teaching of Jesus patibilis, uh, that is, capable of suffering. Jesus is newly crucified in plants, fruits, water, and earth. He is eaten in every holy meal of the elect. Because Jesus is in the plants, every cutting of plants, every harvest, every baking of bread is a slaying of God. Now, the elect have to eat, because this is necessary for life, 
and also because only in this way can they gather into themselves the divine particles dispersed in the world. So when the Manichaeans received the Eucharist, they saw under the form of bread divine particles of light, not the reality of the body of the Lord. Under the form of wine, however, they saw only particles of darkness. So the, the strange Eucharistic practices of the Manichaeans had nothing to do, had everything to do with their particular Gnostic philosophy and nothing to do with the incarnation, life, death, and resurrection of Christ. So Leo interprets their refusal to take part of the chalice as a refusal of the reality of the incarnation of Christ. So uh, he worked strenuously to get the Manichaeans expelled from the city of Rome, even calling on the civil authorities. And the purpose of introducing an explanatory phrase into the words of consecration over the chalice is to affirm that the Eucharist is the mysterium fidei and to deny not to receive the, the, the precious blood is to deny the faith. That's why the phrase, the, uh, the consecration of the chalice was, for this is the chalice of my blood, of the new and everlasting covenant, the mystery of faith, which was poured out for you and for the many for the remission of sins. In this context, then, mysterium fidei means the same thing as the rule of faith, regula fidei. The rule of faith is the baptismal creed as a standard against, to which, against which to measure orthodox or unorthodox teaching. And the mysterium fidei, the mystery of faith, is the Eucharistic practice of the church as a standard against to measure orthodox or heretical teaching. Interesting, isn't it? Now we'll go to Prosper of Aquitaine, number two. Uh, we're dealing here with a document from the Roman Curia around 430 called the Indiculus on divine grace and free will that is probably by Prosper of Aquitaine, though we don't know for sure. The context here is the controversies on the nature of grace between the Augustinian school of North Africa which said that a special intervention of grace is necessary for every good action, and the school of southern France, which said, no, I'm, I'm giving a very rough summary, that God's creation is good because he created it, and therefore God enables man to do good without a special intervention of grace every time. So the quarrel is about the nature of grace. The basic argument of the document I'm going to cite for you is this. The necessity of grace is confirmed by the liturgical practice of the church, by what we call the, the prayers of the faithful, and most particularly the prayers of the faithful on Good Friday, the universal prayers. In, this, in these prayers, if you remember the Good Friday prayers, there are different categories of people that are prayed for. In these prayers, we pray for sinners, for pagans, and so on, which means the fact that we pray for them means that they must need those prayers. That is, they need God's grace. The famous phrase is found in Article 8 of the Indiculus, which I will read for you. Let us next look at the sacred prayers, the prayers of the faithful he's talking about, which, in keeping with the apostolic tradition, our priests offer, after one norm, the world over in every Catholic church, that the rule of prayer, intercessory prayer, that is the prayers of the faithful, but the rule of prayer lay down the rule of faith. When the pastors of the, of the Christian people discharge their mandate and mission, he's referring to the content of these prayers now, they plead the cause of the human race for the divine mercy, and in union with the supplications of the entire church, beg and pray that faith may be given to unbelievers, idolaters freed from the errors of their ungodliness, Jews relieved of their mind's veil and shown the light of truth, schismatics given a spirit of new charity, 
sinners granted salutary penance. Finally, catechumens led to the sacrament of regeneration and admitted to the court of divine mercy. And that all this, that is the various categories of the intercessory prayers, that all this is no pure formality and no vain prayer to the Lord, the facts themselves prove. And the church is so convinced that this is exclusively due to God's action that she offers perpetual thanksgivings to God as to its author and sings his praises for the light and grace bestowed on his people. The phrase uh, that we're focusing on here from that citation is, let the rule of prayer, that is the intercessory prayer of the liturgy, lay down the rule of faith. Uh, in Latin, ut legem credendi lex statua supplicandi. And the saying is often abbreviated and paraphrased, and perhaps you've heard of this, as lex orandi lex credendi. But this is the original context of that phrase. It shows a strict relationship between the liturgy and faith, a reciprocal relationship, that is, faith precedes the liturgy on the one hand, and the liturgy provokes, and nourishes, and forms faith on the other. In this specific context, the liturgy serves as a regula, or norm, for orthodox belief. So in this uh, section B, on the mystery of faith, We've explored the history uh, of, of this expression, and to summarize all of part one, because we need to move on now, I'm already late. <coughs> uh, the rule of faith enables us to interpret the scriptures, define theological terms accurately, establish specific customs of Christian life and practice, and is summarized in the baptismal creed. What's not clear, in this historical period is the nature of church authority which safeguards the rule of faith and discerns what belongs to it and what doesn't, how it develops, what the relationship is between scripture and tradition, the relationship between the magisterium and theology. The second phrase, mysterium fidei, affirms that the liturgical practice of the church is a norm for right belief. What's not addressed is the problem of multiple and sometimes conflicting practices all claiming to be normative, such as the classical problem of the date of Easter, which we looked at. What finally decides this particular controversy of the date of Easter, at least in England, is Roman authority. So even though these categories aren't hard and fast, that is, mysterium fidei, regula fidei, they can be very helpful to us in providing the interpretive glasses we need according to read the scriptures and the tradition according to the mind of the church. Now, that first part in history was longer than I expected. The second part is short, so uh, I beg your, the indulgence of your patience. We'll go 10 minutes over. Let me restrict myself to the last 450 years. The modern period. In Italy, I have a, we have a friend who did her doctoral uh, thesis in modern uh, history. Um, and for Italians, modern history begins after 492, after the discovery of the, of the New World. Okay, uh, under regula fide, we're, we're moving along here. Uh, the Council of Trent, which finished in uh, 15... 65, if I remember correctly, defined many aspects of our faith as a clarifying response to the huge controversies of the Protestant challenge. And in order to enshrine these teachings in catechetical form, the so-called Roman Catechism was drawn up, a compendium of church teaching that served as a catechetical norm for 400 years. Now, the content of faith develops over time as dogmas are articulated, controversies require the clarification of certain points, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, they remain fundamental, but they're not quite enough. So if I ask the question, well, what is the rule of faith after the Council of Trent, 
a simple answer, and perhaps simplistic, but nonetheless useful, is the Roman Catechism. That's the norm. Likewise, with the Second Vatican Council, uh, the, the Vatican Council didn't aim to define articles of faith. While it contains dogmatic constitutions, uh, it doesn't aim to define anything new. What the Council documents do, however, is to express the truths of the faith in a way that people of today can understand in language, categories, and, and approach uh, that are intended to be uh, graspable uh, to people of today. As we have experienced, however, uh, and this happens after every council, uh, there was enormous controversy and confusion in the decades after, after the council because the way we understand the faith is often determined by the kind of language we use. In order to enshrine this new approach that is articulating the ancient truths of the faith in more contemporary language, the Catechism of the Catholic Church was drawn up. So if we ask the question, what is the rule of faith after Vatican II? A simple answer, and perhaps simplistic, but nonetheless useful, is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, this doesn't do away with earlier catechisms, but is a more contemporary formulation. You could say it provides new frames for the glasses, but the lenses remain the same. We're almost at the end. The last point, mysterium fidei. Now, let me limit myself to talking about the Mass, although the liturgy embraces much more. Uh, the Council of Trent, had two chapters on Eucharistic theology. Eucharist as a sacrament, on the one hand, and Eucharist as sacrifice. But because there were problems about liturgical practice, not only theology, the Council mandated a reform of the Mass book, that is, the Roman Missal. And in order to correct abuses, the post-conciliar commission pruned away some of the luxurious growth of poetic texts, uh, tropes and sequences that you probably uh, never heard of because they haven't been around for 400 years. The, this commission reordered the Sancro calendar to reestablish a better harmony between saints' days and ordinary days. And this council chose as the ordinary of the Mass a text dating back to 1502, before the Protestant Reformation, written by a papal master of ceremonies named Johannes Burkhardt as a manual for teaching newly ordained priests how to offer the Mass. So what the post-conciliar commission did was basically a conservative action. Uh, if I can paraphrase, let's get back to basics. Question. If I asked, what is the mystery of faith after the Council of Trent? A simple answer would be, the 1570 Missal. Let's look at Vatican II. The first document of Vatican II was Sacrosanctum Concilium on the liturgy. Pope Benedict, in his preface to the theology of the liturgy, that is the first volume of his collective works, says that it was divine providence that the Council Fathers began with the liturgy, because no matter what their practical motivation might have been, it shows that God, and prayer, and worship have pride of place in our lives. Now, the document on the liturgy proposed certain general principles for reforming the liturgy in order to foster active participation, an expression that's often misinterpreted, so that people could enter into the mystery with greater understanding. And a post-conciliar commission, just like in the Council of Trent, uh, created a novus ordo, and a new missile. If we ask the question, somewhat simplistically, what is the mystery of faith after the Second Vatican Council, the answer would be the 1970 missile. However, a period of extraordinary confusion ensued to the point of schism. And many thoughtful people asked the question, has the standard, the mystery of faith, changed? Is there a relationship between changed prayer and changed practice of the faith? Pope Benedict in two, 2007, with his motu proprio sumorum pontificum, 
tried to bridge the gap, arguing from the principle of continuity. In that text, he says that there are two forms or usages of the Roman rite, both of them legitimate, which form together one lex orandi. The text says, these two expressions of the lex orandi of the church should in no way lead to a division of the lex credendi of the church, for they are two usages of the one Roman rite. So I need to revise my question and revise my answer. That is, if the question revises, if the same question is, what is the mysterium fidei, the mystery of faith after the Second Vatican Council? The revised answer is, the continuity of the liturgical tradition manifested in both the 1570 Missal and the 1970 Missal. So you see how complex and nuanced the discussion becomes. If liturgical practice establishes the law of belief, then what happens when liturgical abuses establish the law of disbelief? A classic example. And we all shudder when we hear things like this. Uh, there have been examples when extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist would dispose of the leftover precious blood by pouring it down the sink. That particular liturgical practice leads to the logical conclusion that this is just wine, that's all. Liturgical abuse establishes the law of disbelief. Now, a the last item, a contemporary example. Without entering into all sorts of controversial topics, because the liturgy tends to be controversial, let me choose a closing example which is instructive but fairly tame. Nobody will get upset about it. The question is, how does liturgical practice, lex orandi, determine belief, lex credendi? And the example is from the Easter Vigil. The issue is this, who lights their candle when from the Paschal candle? Seems rather silly, doesn't it? But uh, I'll explain. What are the theological implications of this? Before the reform of Pius XII, uh, the light didn't come from the Paschal candle, it came from a long pole that had three candles on it in the form of a triangle carried by the deacon, and the celebrant followed after him. And in the, in the Paschal vis, uh, vigil, at the first station, upon entering the church, an acolyte carrying a candle lit from the new fire lights one of the three candles on this triangle thing. The deacon raised the pole, a genuflect, along with everyone else, and sang, Lumen Christi, Deo Gatsnias. That was the first station. The second station, in the middle of the church, a second candle was lit on this triangle with the same procedure. The third station, just before the altar, the third candle was lit, same procedure. Then follows the exalted and the blessing of the Paschal candle. Nobody lit their candles from the Paschal candle. There was no participation except by watching. There's a contemplative participation. In 1955, with the reforms of Holy Week, and so this goes up to 1962, there was no longer a pole with three candles, but only the Paschal candle. The deacon carries the Paschal candle, followed by the priest, the other clergy, and the people. The deacon sings the Lumen Christi at the three stations, but at the first station, the celebrant lights his candle from the Paschal candle. And at the second station, the clergy light their candles from the Paschal candle. And at the third station, the people light their candles from the Paschal candle. So you have participation, but ordered hierarchically. First the priest, then the rest of the clergy, then the people. That's up to 1962. In 1970, with the new Missal, the deacon carries the candle. Uh, at the first station, near the new fire, and the first Lumen Christi, no one lights their candle. At the second station, at the door of the church, the people light their candles. At the third station, in front of the altar, all the lights are turned on. So you have participation of the people only. That is, there's a certain confusion between the ordained priesthood and the baptismal priesthood in the 1970 Missal. 
In the 2002 revision, not so long ago, you have something different. The deacon carries the candle, but the first station is at the door of the church, and the priest lights his candle. The second station is in the middle of the church, and the people light their candles. Third station is in front of the altar, and all the lights are turned on. So, with 40 years of experience, there's a clarification. First, the priest lights his candle, then the people light their candle. So there's a distinction between the ordained priesthood and the baptismal priesthood. Now you might say, well, that's a kind of silly example, but you can see the theological implications because what we do in the liturgy, in this case, how we light our candles from the Paschal candle, says something about the nature of the church and how the church is uh, constituted. Conclusion. The rule of faith and the mystery of faith are like lenses, or bifocals, you might say, which enable us to read and interpret the scriptures and the tradition according to the mind of the church. The frames can change according to the style of the historical period, but the prescription basically remains the same, but can be adjusted from time to time by the optometrist. Uh, the top half of the bifocals, you could say, uh, is the creed, is the interpretive key, the bottom half is the liturgy is the interpretive key, and the optometrist is the competent church authority. But his authority is essential for determining and safeguarding the content of the faith. Concretely, what does all this mean for us? Well, in this uh, period of church history, after 50 years of experience after the Council, because the Your Faith celebrates the 50th anniversary, we need Catholics who are formed by the creed and by the liturgy, that's the objective content of the faith, and who are who live that faith with personal conviction, that's the fides qua, uh, and the fire of the Holy Spirit. This objective content can be summarized very simply. In order to know what the church teaches, you have to read the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's a norm, a standard, for what Catholics believe. And secondly, we need to pay close attention to liturgical practice. We need to observe the indications given in the liturgical books. We can't say, oh, I don't like what it says about lighting your candle from the Paschal candle. I'm going to do something else. No, you do what it says there, because it has implications. That is, liturgical practice is also a norm for what Catholics believe. If we have these interpretive glasses, then we can read the scriptures and read the tradition and read the signs of the times according to the mind of the church. Thank you for being so patient.